One man's hands can't break a prison down. Two men's hands can't break a prison down. But if two and two and fifty make a million, we'll see that day come round. We used to sing that one. You say Aaron Henry, and people reply, you mean Henry Aaron. <laughs> Aaron Henry is one of the somewhat neglected figures of the civil rights struggle, human rights struggle, but one of the longest engaged and most effective soldiers in the fight. Aaron Henry was willing to spend his life hacking away at the prison walls until two more would come along and two more, and he seemingly did the impossible thing, broke the damn prison down. And Professor Morrison showed how he did it and how much it cost him to do it. His was a lifelong struggle. <clears throat> and Minion Casey Morrison gives us all the details of the endless fights as the forces against him and the Mississippians writhed and struggled to counter his and his cohorts every move. Professor Morrison lets us see every twist and turn in the point, counterpoint, of a life and death combat which holds our attention as it goes deeper into the human determination to achieve respect and the right of civil discourse. To quote John Dittmer, it, this book, represents a major contribution to the historiography of the civil rights movement. And I was talking with uh, Professor Morrison during lunch about that whole issue of adding to the history of this, uh, and the recent history of the South and how much we still have to learn uh, about what took place and who was involved and what they did and why they did it. Professor Morrison has brought Aaron Henry to the notice and understanding of a broader audience, which has been a long needed lesson in the opposite of the oft heard statement about, my vote won't make a difference. Clearly, one man can make a profound difference. We are happy and privileged today to award the Lillian Smith Prize to Professor Minion K.C. Morrison for his work in shining the light of his intellect on this hero of the human rights struggle who brought about such a profound change. Thank you very much. Um, I wish to express my appreciation to the University of Georgia Libraries, to the Southern Regional Council, Piedmont College, um, uh, Georgia Center for the Book, uh, and the other sponsors who organize this event um, every year, and to the judges who selected this work for recognition which I'm happy to be sharing with Professor uh, Not, Without libraries, none of us could accomplish any of um, these things. I am particularly pleased to have Aaron Henry's life and work associated with the profound contribution of a woman who exhibited Henry's type and range of leadership and courage in a time and place that was almost boundless in its denial of voice to African Americans and women. So I'm happy to have an award that seems so appropriate in the way the lives of these two resonate. So I thank you very much for the honor 
Which owes everything to Aaron Henry for providing a story worth the telling and for composing a compelling life that offers continuing lessons for path to fundamental social change. For me as a political scientist, perhaps it was foolish to undertake this task. That might have been best left to an historian, and there are great historians in this room today. Yet it was Henry's engagement with politics and his vision for political change that seemed right to occupy me. It fit with my scholarly work in comparative politics, mostly identified with the struggles to mobilize for political voice by repressed ordinary citizens in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. But what I learned uh, along uh, the way in the 15-year lifespan of this project, as has been noted already, uh, was that I had to employ a good deal of the craft of historians to pull it off. And your recognition gives me some confidence that I did it reasonably well. <laughs> the story is there for your reading. I will say simply that this is a political biography of uh, Aaron Henry, a man who was active in the civil rights movement in Mississippi from about 1952 until the end of his life in 1997. Uh, uh, he was a leader of the social movement in the streets in the state. He was a formal political leader. He led the Democratic Party uh, in the state and became a state legislature, le legislator. And he was a major figure in democratic politics um, in uh, this country. In any case, the story is there for your reading, and I hope you will read it. So let me just say a word about the actual work and the man. Henry was that rare individual who successfully combined social movement and formal political leadership while maintaining integrity to the dictates of challenge and struggle inherent in social movement activism. His success seemed inherent in his uh, original and enduring vision and method. He never separated social movement requirements from political activism. And seeing no disjuncture between the two, was able to carry them both along from the start. Even as his NAACP chapter in Clarksdale in 19, the early 1960s challenged segregated bus stations, he simultaneously managed a campaign to challenge the Lily White Mississippi Congressional Delegation. No black candidate had run for such a seat since Reconstruction when blacks were stripped of the franchise. He never wavered in that combined method and vision in seeking citizenship regularity for African Americans. The final point I would make about his life and contribution is about its longevity. That's already been noted. And the fundamental change that it made for. Now, in some ways, his longevity may have been accidental. Many people like him were murdered, harassed, and or intimidated into silence. In any case, he lived a full life, notwithstanding monumental efforts to silence him and maintain the good fight until a natural death. In the process, he gave leadership to the most profound social and political change for full citizen inclusion in Mississippi history no one with a progressive social change project had his time in place or his endurance.
for all that Mississippi was, is, and will be, the changes he wrought offer a template well worth holding on to. And finally, there's always the personal in doing a work that takes you 15 years. Uh, during this work, my own story endured the most profound changes imaginable. The life of my wife, Janetta, ended just as a project she also lived with for 15 years was about to appear. And so, my daughter, Dr. Iabo Morrison, who's here, if you will raise your hand. Um, uh, uh, she and I have picked up what is left and move along. I do so in addition with the most remarkable family of classmates, friends, and scholarly associates, several of whom are here today. I won't call their names, but it does me proud that you have come all this way <laughs> to take uh, uh, part in this. It would take a long time to communicate the depth of support the classes of 1964 in Utica, Mississippi and the 1968 uh, class at Tougaloo provide me. I thank them as I thank you. I'm very happy to receive this award. Thank you very much. Well, as uh, was, was said, we uh, have time for some questions. If anyone has any questions for our authors, I'm sure they'll be glad to entertain them. Well, uh, that's an interesting part of his story, um, uh, the entrepreneurship, uh, and it goes back to the kind of household he grew up in. Um, he um, was raised by an uncle and, and um, the uncle's wife um, because his parents died when I think he was about five. They were sharecroppers, but were intent on getting out of sharecropping and into entrepreneurship. Um, and so they moved uh, before Henry first goes to school into town. I almost said city, except there are no cities in Mississippi. Uh, they moved to town, and Clarksdale was a flourishing cotton town just off the Mississippi River, so there was significant wealth uh, there, and it was possible to be an entre entrepreneur. Um, and so his mother uh, operated a beauty salon, and we all know what an effective <laughs> opportunity for entrepreneurship that is in, in any community. And his father was a cobbler. And the story gets more interesting and complicated from there because they were all imbued with a notion of entrepreneurship as they understood Booker T. Washington's model. And they were both influenced by it. His father was trained as a cobbler by people who had gone to Tuskegee. And his mother actually goes to Tuskegee for some education. She's unable to remain there. Uh, but they are imbued with this notion of entrepreneurship that was as complicated for them as it was for Booker T. Washington, uh, by the way. The region of the northern delta in Mississippi where they lived was a, a part of a very successful and interesting entrepreneurial set of enterprises by black people. There was, after all, 
Mound Bayou, a black town that had been built um, by enslaved uh, persons from Jefferson Davis's plantation. They'd come uh, and built a black town, and it had very great hopes for a major economic engine uh, for the region. So this is the milieu into which uh, Henry is born. So he was a natural entrepreneur, he was a natural capitalist. He goes to the army, he goes to pharmacy school, and he starts a pharmacy business. But he is no ordinary entrepreneur. You see, his pharmacy became just a salon for the civil rights movement as it developed in that uh, area. And his wife allegedly said it was a deal they made together when um, they married, that he was going to dedicate his life uh, to social change and that his business was going to be um, a part of that, um, and, and so it was. Um, now, he was an entrepreneur and a capitalist, but money was not personally important to him in, 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 in the nature of greed in routine capitalism. And so Aaron Henry made money, but he didn't spend money. And so he wore frumpy suits and <laughs> that sort of thing, and old, drove old cars uh, and that. And his uh, acquisition of a television station, which made him a millionaire, was a product of challenging uh, the television station that was the major media carrier in Mississippi, was because African Americans could not participate in that and because they were not being portrayed, as he put it, as regular members of, of, of the community. So the object in acquiring the station, WLBT is what it was called, was not to make the tremendous money that accrued to him as a product of owning it. Um, and, and he came to own it, actually, after challenging the license because when he was a candidate, mock candidate, mind you, <laughs> for governor of the state of Mississippi, they refused to give him airtime on the television station. And he says, well, hell, if I can't have airtime, uh, uh, I'm going to call you to account. He didn't mean that he would come to own it. Uh, but that was uh, what actually worked out. It also explains the level of practicality in his approach um, to politics. But it is marvel that he could maintain integrity to this notion of progressive social change, even as he understood the practicalities of being a former politician and the sort of pushing and shoving and compromise that was required in all that, but he maintained integrity, and that's the extraordinary part of this, this story. Thank you. Yes, sir. doesn't relate to libraries, but it's very important to uh, Henry's ability to get a secondary school education. Um, in Mississippi at the time, uh, there were very few places where blacks could go to a high school by the day. I mean, you've had the, the, the wherewithal to get to a boarding school if you could be sent somewhere. So that meant, in point of fact, that most blacks just didn't go to high school because there was no high school to go to. 
it's fortuitous that the Rosenwall and the philanthropic community built a school five miles from Aaron Henry, uh, from where he lived and grew up. I mean, the, the, just the, the uh, um, accidental nature of something like that. Uh, there is a school uh, that he's able uh, to get to. So they play a very important role um, in uh, Mississippi because the state was not supporting uh, black schools. We all know this story. They were not supporting black schools at the level they were supporting white schools. But the African-American community was forced to subsidize the schools that blacks did get. The churches that African-Americans owned were the sites of African-American schools. So they were, they were doubly taxed to provide schooling uh, for their children. And because of the paucity of what the state was putting in, the philanthropic organizations uh, helped uh, to build schools in these communities. So it's very important that in Clarksdale, there just happened to be uh, a Rosenwall school. Yeah. Well, there are historians in the room that can do better in answering that question than I can, but um, uh, there, there is a direct connection insofar as Washington are urging them to be sponsors. Um, and and this, this is uh, um, you know, one of the complicated things about Washington, who, who is misunderstood around the edges, um, be, because when I was looking at the um, curriculum for the high school where Aaron Henry went, it was supposedly based to some degree on what white state officials presumed was the template at Tuskegee. And so there was some agricultural this and that, there was some, you know, how to do farming and, and so on. But Harren Henry also took chemistry and algebra um, and world history, and he read things that were absolutely subversive, <laughs> like Richard Wright. He says, for example, which was banned in Mississippi at the time, right? He says, one of the most important pieces of literature for him was Richard Wright's Black Boy. Well, he's one, one's supposed to be reading Richard Wright, for heaven's sake. <laughs> um, so, so it was, it was a misunderstanding about some of what Booker T. Washington was, was doing there. And I'm as critical of Washington as any, anybody else is. I mean, there was, some of that was, was pretty messed up. Uh, but some of it uh, was subversive stuff. And so in the collusion in trying to get philanthropists to buy into the school project was a part of Washington's mission of making the community self-sufficient self uh, and, and not just to plow, but you know, plowing was, was, was a part of it. You know, I've had the good fortune of working with the, uh, <laughs> the jury as they've gone through these books, and there are certain themes that, uh, that, that you find common in, in, a, in a number of them. Uh, and uh, a couple of years ago, we had uh, a winner that was all about the, the movement in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, and so it was very interesting to me when uh, Dr. Morrison talked about the role. He almost finished. 
his presentation, and then he mentioned Tougaloo College. And m maybe everybody here is aware of the role that Tougaloo College played during that time, um, but at the risk that there may be some who aren't, could you share a little about the role that uh, Tougaloo College played? Well, you know, I, it's, uh, I can talk a long time uh, about Tougaloo, and, and so I was trying to minimize <laughs> Uh, because it's a very important place uh, in my own life and, and my, my, my sort of being. Um, it was known in Mississippi as Cancer College. Uh, it was uh, one of the private um, black colleges that had always been known as an oasis uh, in Mississippi because it was integrated um, in the early days uh, mostly in its faculty. Um, uh, but the state forces were unhappy about a place like that. Uh, and so they tried desperately to remove the college's charter to operate. Now, just to uh, uh, um, explain how they could be so riled up about uh, uh, Tougaloo that they had dubbed uh, Cancer College, Tougaloo was doing things like um, having integrated classrooms, uh, sending people out to public uh, demonstrations in integrated groups, uh, and to speak of public libraries, um, had a group that was called the Tougaloo Nine, I believe it was, was a group of students uh, who in making the first stand that is going to become a street movement in the state challenged the segregated library. Uh, and they, of, of course, are um, all uh, arrested. And so Tougaloo was just um, a stain on uh, uh, for. Um, and it was a place that served as a uh, safe place. Now, being safe in Mississippi in the days of segregation was, you know, there, there is safe and there is safe uh, and not quite safe. Uh, we had gates beyond which we, we could take you, uh, but we couldn't uh, prevent bombs uh, from being thrown at the college and shots being uh, uh, fired and so on, but it was seen as a safe space for movement people because it was where you could have that conversation. And we had an administration that supported those kinds of efforts. So when I arrived there in 1965, and this is at the tail end of the good stuff, <laughs> uh, I was going to a place where Martin Luther King uh, had come and been received where Stokely Carmichael had come and been received, where Fannie Lou Hamer uh, had come and uh, sang this little light of mine, but also turned on that fire in her as an ordinary woman uh, who was making an appropriate interpretation of her circumstance. Uh, uh, on a Mississippi plantation. So it, it was this um, uh, place that really one could say was a movement institution. Uh, and it was a part of that uh, uh, richness that Willie Roy, one of my classmates uh, who's here, and I shared as uh, young people sort of coming into our own and learning to think about 
this place where we grew up um, and acquiring a commitment to change it. And Tougaloo was fundamental to that. 